Welcome to Mom in Mind, a podcast about maternal mental health from conception, pregnancy, to birth and postpartum. Real stories from moms and family members who've made it from struggling to wellness, and interviews with experts and advocates who work for moms and families to get the help they need. We discuss very real struggles that can sometimes be hard to hear, but these are stories that need to be told so that moms and families can know that healing is possible. This podcast is meant to offer information and awareness and is not a replacement for treatment by a professional or professional training. Thank you for being with us today. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Mom in Mind. I'm your host, Dr. Kat. In this episode, we're talking with Dr. Melinda Chom about the unique challenges related to perinatal mood and anxiety disorders in the military, both for the perinatal mother who is in active duty and for the perinatal mother who is the spouse of an active duty person. There are so many unique challenges for this population and difficult barriers to treatment. So we're going to get a glimpse of all of this from Dr. Chom. This is one of those topics that we're going to be touching on just a little bit, but there's so much to learn. And I'm happy to really give this kind of introductory episode for everyone who's interested in this population and for the moms who are in this population and are having difficulty finding the resources that they need. I think this will be a really great intro and a look into the world of perinatal mental health in the military. Dr. Melinda Chom, MD, is a board-certified staff psychiatrist who was a military psychiatrist until she retired this past June 2017. She is currently splitting her time between private practice psychiatry with Future Psych Solutions in Columbia, South Carolina, and community mental health. Although Dr. Chom treats a variety of conditions, her favorite passion and largest area of expertise is women's mental health, in particular women's mental health surrounding pregnancy, childbirth, the postpartum period, and new motherhood. She earned her medical degree at Uniformed Services University in the Health Sciences and initially started her medical career in pediatrics where she completed a pediatric internship at Madigan Army Medical Center near Tacoma, Washington. During her time in pediatrics, Dr. Chom witnessed the challenges of perinatal mental health for numerous spouses who had to give birth alone while their spouses were overseas serving the country. Dr. Chom was also able to experience firsthand the challenges of being an active duty mother in the military. Through these experiences, she saw many mothers suffer in silence as they found that pregnancy was not the joyous period they thought it was, and new motherhood was met with darkness, a sense of shame, and the belief that one was a bad mother. So Dr. Chom switched over to psychiatry with the desire to specialize in women's mental health. In her residency, she began working intensively with pregnant mothers, postpartum mothers, and women struggling with infertility and loss, as well as mood issues surrounding menstrual cycles and menopause. She led a mother-infant dyad therapy group for the last two years of residency and went on to recruit a group of perinatal mental health experts in the military civilian population to edit the manuscript Perinatal Mental Health and the Military Family, Identifying and Treating Mood and Anxiety Disorders. While this book is targeted toward military population, it is also applicable to the general population. So let's hear from Dr. Chum. Welcome, Dr. Chom. Thank you so much for being with us. No problem. It's an honor to be here. I'm really excited to talk with you about the work that you do and also happy to, to be giving the audience this great information about military families and military spouses and people birthing within the military situation. So please tell us about the work that you do. Well, I started off as a military psychiatrist, actually as a pediatrician. And one of my most kind of remarkable memories is being on the mother-baby ward and maybe 20 out of the 30 moms that were there were delivering their babies wow. with their husbands deployed downrange. And we saw kind of the impact it had. And so that's where I kind of became interested in it. And from that point, I kind of gravitated towards that when I switched over to psychiatry. And psychiatry actually started a mother-infant group therapy and actually found that it was a huge kind of disparity of care in that area, especially with the military family. Mm particularly because the active duty military moms would be worried about seeking treatment mainly for fear of uh, career repercussions. And then the right. spouses 
couldn't really get on base for treatment. So they also had a challenge. Oh, wow. Right. For just logistical reasons, they're not being able to access care. Yeah. Well, what happens with the military treatment facilities, whether it's the Army, Navy, Air Force, they have priority towards the active duty Mm -hmm. and then it's followed by the active duty family members. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge shortage of behavioral health providers, particularly on post. And then we also have a huge need for our service members. That's a huge demand for that. So they would get priority over the to the family members because it was always assumed that they could easily, you know, find care off post. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. So there's part of the challenge then is you need more providers and then getting the resources to people that need it. Wow. That seems like a big, big barrier to people getting the help they need. Yes. And the other issue is even if there are providers, they're not always high quality providers. Fortunately, TRICARE, a lot of people do not want to accept TRICARE. Mm-hmm. So those that do sometimes may not be necessarily high quality providers. Okay. So and very specifically then with a perinatal population, well, how do you, maybe I'll table that for just a minute and kind of first learn a little bit more about perinatal mood and anxiety disorders within the military. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about what you see? What are some unique challenges? Any information for us would be great. Well, I think it's a very unique population. It is one of the younger populations by default. People in the military tend to marry earlier. They tend to have kids at a younger age. Hmm. And they also then tend to be in that risk demographic that we associate with many perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. They're usually young. This might be the first time away from home. They might be isolated. There are many people who will go to with their spouse to another base. And again, I generically will reference as, you know, the male being the active duty provider or active duty service member predominantly because the military is 84% male with that. And so people will go to another base and then they're really isolated by themselves. And Mm -hmm. you add that to the challenges of the military kind of culture and then just the disparity it is in perinatal mental health in general and it becomes a perfect storm. Wow. Okay. So uh, you were already describing the kind of the lack of the support that just in general people need and then very specifically to perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. I imagine you're one of few people who are highly trained within the military to do this specific work. It's training that I kind of took upon myself like it is for many psychiatrists who go into that perinatal mental health or reproductive psychiatry. Mm -hmm. I grew interested in it when I was looking and researching the majority of this area in the military has predominantly been through OB and a little bit through pediatrics because of the impact of deployment on families. And that's kind of how most of the research comes from, not even perinatal in particular. Just deployment in general. Yes, because the impact of deployment on infants and babies and tends to happens to be infants and babies, that brings you into the perinatal period. Right. So what are the things? You, I mean, I'm thinking then to kind of get a, us for to get a basic understanding of what happens. There's the mother who is the active duty spouse who's staying, whose partner has been deployed. And then there's also an active duty person who's pregnant. And I imagine those challenges are different. They're different, but they're also alike in one way. Mm-hmm. There's another population that there's very little research on is also like the veteran population as well as your reserve. Oh, wow. So your garden reserve families live in the civilian community and usually are embedded there and they don't really have access to a base. Mm-hmm. On post, the military spouses at least have some form of community. But, and so again, it really depends on where you're stationed also. Okay. So I'm just, as you're talking about this, I'm wondering if some of the kind of risk factor then is having a community or that the community is changing fairly often in terms of, you know, people coming and going. Yeah. It's a double-edged sword because again, with military, the average kind of duty station is between two to three years. Mm-hmm. For the military child, I think the, one of the latest statistics is they move six to nine times by the time they're around 12 years old. Wow. And so the kids turn over. And so if once you finally get an established network, even people in the military might gravitate towards this really quickly and establish Mm -hmm. the network quickly. But then as soon as they get those friendships developed, stay upright and they have to move again. Yeah, that's challenging. Talk a little bit more about the pregnant or postpartum woman whose partner is on active duty and elsewhere. What are some things that you see for them that makes this time more challenging? One is the unpredictability. I think there's a common misconception. I've seen this in the military where some people will state, well, you're lucky you're in the military, you have job security. Well, that's not actually a case anymore. Mm. With the downsizing in the military, people have kind of been told to be let go. 
mm. for lack of better terms, began the pink slip. There's also at any point, it really, it's the needs of the military. Mm -hmm. There's an old saying that if the military wanted you to have a family, they would have issued you one. Oh. And so you actually have to go where the military says and at when the military says. So it doesn't matter what you have planned, you kind of have to go. And so that's a huge challenge. So spouses can, you know, up and have to up their careers, up their schooling, up mm -hmm. a lot of things. And so that's already kind of predisposing them to mood and anxiety disorders. And then let's say they get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And especially within the high deployment tempo in the last 10 years, many of those got pregnant just to discover that they are now, their husband was being deployed overseas. Wow. And that in and of itself, just not having your partner, your support around would be difficult and challenging. But then there's all these other factors you're describing too, that they themselves, a pregnant or new mom is having to figure out resources in a new place or all of those things. Yeah. And some of them are really good at finding resources. Mm -hmm. And then other ones, it takes a lot of effort. So especially if she's struggling with depression and anxiety, right. when the pregnancy starts, she's not going to have the kind of the energy or the motivation to kind of look for those resources. Oh, sure. That would be incredibly challenging. And then but I'm thinking too, then there's probably not family around. And with the families, even then the family of origin is not always necessarily beneficial. And sometimes there are occasions, let's say, when the active duty service member deploys and the civilian spouse will go home with her, you know, her family or a place where she knows. But that also still has, you know, you're gone for what, a six to 15 month deployment and mm -hmm. then you're kind of going back and forth. So you're moving even more. Wow. But then is... Just in general, do you see that the risk of a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder is higher in this population? There have been kind of contradictory statistics, but given the risk of mood and anxiety disorders, period, uh -huh. are higher in this population, I would say yes, because you also have to confound that with the active duty service member having a higher risk of behavioral health disorders, PTSD, mm -hmm. all kinds of depression coming from combat. So probably, I guess, yeah. probably the risk is higher. So if you can speak a little bit to the active duty service member who's pregnant. So it's always interesting because around, you know, 50 to 60 years ago, active duty women were actually discharged from service if they were pregnant. And so nowadays it can be a huge challenge, especially in our age of kind of gender equality, where it becomes a challenge for the military unit because if a woman is pregnant. She obviously can't be deployed. She can't be put on certain duties. She can't do certain types of military tasks. And so the unit can see that as a burden, mm -hmm. depending on the unit. And so people can look at that as more of a liability than as an asset, which can kind of be hard for the mother. Wow. So that's part one. The part two is also there's a lot of regulations in the different services about what they have to do during pregnancy, having to have a family care plan, having to abide by still height and weight challenges because whatever weight you gain, you usually have to lose that within six months or you literally can lose your job. Wow. Okay. So, and that's like for logistical or regulatory or some other kinds of issues. Yeah. Military um, standards. Military standards. Okay. So then if somebody is pregnant, then I imagine then they're, if they had a certain type of job or now they can't do that, they're being reassigned to a different sort of job or... And it varies by service. For instance, Navy has a lot of kind of shore duty and sea duty. Mm -hmm. And so with the Navy, that can be put in a billet or a slot that doesn't tend to, that's not likely to make them in a deployable spot. Mm -hmm. The Army does not have that as of yet. I've had many soldiers who found out they were pregnant and they were going to be sent to a highly deployable unit which means they're going to go to this unit that is highly deployable. They're going to be mm -hmm. stuck in kind of the rear detachment, which is kind of like the leftover. I mean, they're the ones that help you know, support from the rear, but also many people kind of look at it as leftovers. And so mm -hmm. the unit's going to be down as a member of the team because they're going to have to deploy without her because mm -hmm. her number is going to be counting against that team. Okay. So it became a hard thing for the soldier to go to a new duty station just to find out that, no, she can't deploy. And this person you thought was going to be a resource is not a resource. So that puts them both in a hard spot. Okay, so that's Navy and Army. And so depending on what jobs they are doing, um, they would potentially have to change change what their expectations were about what their job's going to be. Yeah, it depends on it because there's certain, all services have different kind of pregnancy limitations. All of them, almost all universally will, you know, you're no longer part of the unit PT, mm -hmm. physical training. So that can also be 
challenge and a blessing in and of itself because now that camaraderie and that kind of team building that might have been done, doing through fitness in the morning, mm-hmm. uh, now they're kind of left out of. And a lot of times they're kind of left on their own to figure out their pregnancy fitness. I'm wondering then if somebody is in active duty, and like, like what kind of supports do women have like when they're out in active duty, who would they go to if they were having challenges or difficulties? Theoretically, it's supposed to be the command because mm-hmm. the command has to have a policy on what to do with pregnant soldiers. Okay. And service varies by this, but you know, as each service varies by it, so does each commander. And some commanders are very supportive of it. Other commanders are not supportive of it. And they can indirectly kind of go about this. Most of them won't kind of directly go against it, but there have been comments by, you know, soldiers saying that they're a waste of a soldier if they become pregnant, you know, because they can't do their job. And so they get all these kind of derogatory comments mm-hmm. or the military doesn't condone that, but still, it still happens. Okay. So there's what they don't condone, but then there's a sort of, I'm assuming a culture of mm-hmm. sorts around pregnancy and how people are treated. Yeah. Well, in general, I know, especially in the army, just having anything wrong with you, whether it's a broken leg, a bad ankle, it's kind of viewed as a broken soldier. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, pregnancy makes you quote unquote broken, you know, and and sometimes in that culture's eyes. And so you can't perform the job as a soldier if you're pregnant because you cannot, ultimately you cannot deploy. And so they can, with that culture, people can take that to extremes. And Mm -hmm. some people kind of are more accepting of it. It really varies depending on the unit. And the commands. Right. So this is all like U.S. specific stuff, but some of these folks are also deployed elsewhere, like out into the world. And for the active duty, once you are pregnant, you are not deployable across all services Mm. in that sense. So if you were on a deployment and found out that you were pregnant, you get sent home. But you still can, as early as in the Army, six months later after giving birth, then go back and deploy. So after birth, they can be active again after six months? Yeah, it used to be four months. And I believe around 2008, the Army changed it to six months. The Air Force and the Navy both are usually a year, unless the mom waives her right to wait a year. That's fascinating. So that you, you said waive the right. So they have the right to take off for those either six months or a year, depending on where they are. Yeah, some mothers will want to deploy with their unit and they'll say, that's okay, even though I'm not 12 months, I want to deploy. Because again, they're kind of chose, you know, it's, it can be the choice, like, what do you want to do for your career versus your child? And so that's can be a huge, tough thing. And there have actually been mothers who've deployed downrange to the desert and have pumped and shipped breast milk back home. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay. That's like a whole other line of questioning that I have now. That's amazing. I'm just like, that's a level of dedication that, oh, oh, wow, yeah. wow. Say there's even a whole website, breastfeeding and combat boots dedicated. What? For duty women. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. That is amazing. So I'm like yeah. pausing here for a second because I'm just soaking in that, that. Wow. I'll have to send you the article. It was about a physician who pumped it and how it had to get through customs and the expenses and all that stuff just to because she deployed less than a year after a child was born and uh, Mm. she was dedicated to making sure her child was breastfed. Oh my gosh. You have to freeze it. Okay. Logistically, just financially, that's a lot to figure out. Just even that, like, you know, breastfeeding and sending milk back and all of that stuff. Just, there are so many other. Well, there's challenges to being a mom in the military. Right. Yes, exactly. So there are challenges in being a mother just in general. And as I'm learning more about this, I'm hearing just how many more challenges there could be potentially. I'm going to just assume that for some people, it's not a challenge. Some people are fine or don't feel as challenged by it, but I'm sure a lot of people most are. most of them do. Because even culturally, even though we're supposed to say both parents are involved, mm-hmm. they still kind of expect that dad is going to, it's more permissive for dad, let's, let's say an active duty service member to deploy and leave his newborn baby at home. Mm-hmm. But let's say if mom deploys for, after four to six months, she's abandoning her kids. And I've had actually had you know, soldiers and veterans and retirees actually say that you know, when they were an active duty service mother, you know, their significant other at the time actually accused them of abandoning the kids. They did not say that to the, the active duty fathers. Right. They might, but often, but then on the reverse side, it, that can be hard for dads because they're kind of assumed to be kind of cut out and to be disinvolved. Right. So then the mother who's back home with a baby who may or may not have supports around her is doing everything. 
And sometimes service members have said that's the harder thing because let's say uh, dad is deployed, he's downrange, he just has to focus on the mission. Mm-hmm. You know, just not much else he has to do versus, you know, uh, the mother at home, she has to do all, navigate all the needs of the baby, the finances, keep, take care of the house or the apartments or the rental, you know, has to be able to manage the day-to-day stuff that kind of goes on versus just simply keeping your mind on the mission. So it makes me wonder then if let's say the the mom who's back potentially living on base or nearby, are there generally supports there for new mothers or no? It's very variable. There are some places where they have something in the varies by name of service, but a family readiness group where the spouses of active duty service members will kind of support each other. Mm-hmm. Each base is different. Your other challenge are not the ones who may be deployed, but the ones who have a very highly demanding job stateside. Oh. For instance, real sergeants. Mm-hmm. They're gone from about 4 a.m. to about 10 p.m. What? Um, yes. Oh, my gosh. And so many people have said they almost rather be deployed because it, it gives the a false illusion that dad mm-hmm. is there. Right. But he's really not. For all intents and purposes, he's spending most of his days training a bunch of 17 and 18 year olds how to survive in combat. Oh my gosh. Okay. So support is limited and you are working really hard to support a lot of people. I'm thinking just in terms of your role, are you seeing primarily then just perinatal women? That's my goal. When I was an active duty psychiatrist, you kind of had to see only what kind of came your way. Yeah. We're trying to recruit that because, you know, that my colleague at Future Psych, he's TRICARE certified. We can actually take TRICARE spouses. And so we're trying to attract a lot more of those. And part of it's just kind of getting the word out because where I'm stationed, we have, it's a smaller base. Mm-hmm. And so there's all the medical, all the OB is sent out to the network. Oh, so okay. if you give a false illusion about how many people are actually struggling mm-hmm. because, you know, oh. what is, you know, kind of, if we don't see it, it doesn't exist. It's not really true, but, mm-hmm. you know, versus places, let's say at Fort Belvoir, where they had a lot of OB in the area and they're a little bit more aware of the mm-hmm. challenge. So mm-hmm. really, it really depends on the area. I think it's everywhere. There's like military communities. It's just depends on how aware the medical treatment facility is about them. So in terms of access to services and finding the help and support that people need, what are the challenges there and what can we do? I think the challenges, again, are trying to network between a military system and a civilian system, as well as address an area that tends to have a shortage of knowledge in general, mm. with perinatal mental health. Biggest challenge right now, again, since most of the care is going to be happening outside the military medical treatment facility, is a need for quality network providers who, number one, take TRICARE, number two, can understand perinatal mental health, and number three, can understand the military family. There are training resources on the military family out there, not perinatal related, Mm -hmm. but on the military family. For instance, Zero to Three has many webinars about the military family and deployment in the military family. So does Mm -hmm. the Department of Deployment Psychology. So they all have trainings just in the military family in general, because I think part of that is just understanding the culture. You know, active duty and dependent mothers have gone to providers on the outside and they don't understand, like, why can't your husband or why can't you just quit your job? Oh, Right. Okay. So there are these, like, it sounds like the three things that are necessary. And I'm thinking in terms of, you know, the therapists who are listening and also Mm -hmm. the moms in need who are listening is to have a therapist who takes TRICARE, who is trained in perinatal mental health and also understands military families. So both for providers who want to support this population, those are the things they need. And then also for the moms who are listening if you want someone who really gets what's going on for you, then look to be looking for that, those three things. Yeah. I think if they get the perinatal part, the, the providers who are likely to understand perinatal will understand the military oh, because the mothers yeah. can actually train them and kind of mm-hmm. coach you know, their patient with that. Mm-hmm. The other big thing is of August 28th this year, TRICARE is now starting to approve the use of teletherapy that oh. can be provided in the mother's home. So that creates a huge accessibility barrier where mothers you know, have an infant or they have other kids are trying to juggle and they just mm-hmm. can't get out to see the therapist. So mm-hmm. it opens it up for if therapists are willing to take TRICARE, they can do a lot more teletherapy. That's going to open up a huge population and fill up a huge need in that area. Okay, so that's one big area that needs more resources mm-hmm. that hopefully people who are hearing this can, who have an interest or have the inclination can get on and get that perinatal mental health training. And right, so, so many people need this help. What other kinds of resources have you found to be useful? One of the resources they have that's kind of been a hit or miss in a lot of the military places is something called New Parent Support mm-hmm. Program. 
it was in the army it was uh, actually created under the family advocacy program for high risk families, but kind of generalized out where you can have a nurse actually visit the home of a new parent. It doesn't have to be a brand new parent. It could be a second time parent. It could be a third, you know, where they actually will help treat them, teach them how to, you know, diaper the baby, help treat, you know, and so that in and of itself kind of helps kind of help with those, the mother who might be struggling on her own because, mm-hmm. you know, dad is deployed, right. you know, or just because she's never done this before. She doesn't have a friend or a family member who can help her. Right. So really support, having the support available and accessible <laughs> where those moms are. That would be on base, correct? Those ones are on base because they don't have an equivalent in the civilian community yet. Okay. Would, if there were an, an equivalent in the civilian community just for military moms? I think that'd be very helpful. The other thing is getting support groups going up. Mm-hmm. Again, there's a disparity of support groups or therapy groups for kind of new mothers alone. Right. Let alone for the military. Right, because right. Because again, it's really hard to get any type of group going and sustained, especially with the military population that might be changing every three years. Right. Wow. So this has to be really fluid and flexible on some level mm-hmm. to be able to accommodate the needs. <sighs> okay. So you also have a book, Perinatal Mental Health in the Military Family, Identifying and Treating Mood and Anxiety Disorders. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is that a possible resource mm-hmm. for both mothers and providers? Um, yes, I actually started that off of forming a group when I was in residency where we found out there was just not a lot of information. And through it, I started to create a manual, trying to gear towards the moms when I discovered that a lot of providers didn't know much about it. And so I would often read a lot of articles, find links to other providers where I ended up meeting and, you know, kind of experts across the field where I ended up having a Navy obstetrician. I had a Air Force educator who was a labor and delivery nurse who did a lot of research on this area. I have a developmental pediatrician over at Madigan. You know, we also found one of the providers at San Diego knew somebody and we ended up finding Dr. Singley, who's an expert in men's mental health. Mm-hmm. And through this, we started kind of networking, finding many different kind of providers kind of across the military yeah. services who kind of were experts. And I thought, you know, it'd be a great way to kind of combine a bunch of expert field one geared towards the primary care provider, but, you know, readable enough that the moms can understand it. That's fantastic. I want to make sure to have that as a clickable resource for people in the show notes for this episode. But it seems like, I mean, just we're scratching the surface here of what is going on for the perinatal mother in the military and the family who has a new baby. And it sounds like there's just so much more that we all need to know, especially if we're going to be helping this population to just that everybody kind of needs more training <laughs> and the moms themselves need more support too. There's just so much information and I'm really hopeful that the people who are listening can hear the need and if they feel called to like help fill these gaps to jump on that. And I think a helpful thing too would just be the more we train about perinatal mental health in general to kind of tack on that those kind of unique populations like the military. Yeah. That's going to reach a lot of your providers who love that area. Yeah. Um, and who, again, the other thing is, is hopefully with TRICARE and it's things changing, they, uh, they're now, there's two contracts for TRICARE. There's one in the West and one on the East. And hopefully that's going to simplify things so that their payment is better. Mm-hmm. And so people are more willing to take TRICARE. Mm-hmm. Because with insurances, you can wait six to eight weeks to get paid for services you provide. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is a long time. Thank you so much, Dr. Chom, for coming on and giving us all of this great information. And as I said, we're just scratching the surface. And hopefully people can go and grab your book and really start to understand the depth of the need here and the intricacies so more moms can be helped. I guess the one comment I also want to say regarding the book, because all but maybe two or three authors were either active duty military, they were worked for the military, Basically, all this was done on volunteer time. We don't get mm-hmm. anything for the book. So it's mm-hmm. not, it's always like to say it's not any kind of marketing thing for it. It's more of just kind of increasing awareness. Mm-hmm. All these authors put in that kind of much effort and time basically because they're passionate about this population, mm-hmm. which is very That's encouraging. Amazing. Yes, it is. Thank you so much for all of the work that you do. It's an honor to talk with you today. Well, thank you. And thank you for uh, caring about our military families. I do. There's so much to think about for this population, perinatal mental health in the military. As we talked about before, we're touching on a lot of different topics here that really need some more in-depth understanding. So if you are a mother who is experiencing some of these 
barriers to treatment and are really looking for support, I really encourage you to check out the book, Perinatal Mental Health and the Military Family, Identifying and Treating Mood and Anxiety Disorders. An additional resource is on the Postpartum Support International website. There is a section on getting support for military families specifically, and there's a point person for the Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, Air Force, and the Army Reserves. There's also some information on there on the report on potential effects of spousal military deployment and postpartum depression. So there are some resources available. Hopefully people are getting the training that they need. But as Dr. Chom said, if you're interested in supporting this population, just really having a good fundamental understanding of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders is a great place to begin. And certainly there is a need for a lot more providers to be able to support these moms and families. So I thank you again for being with us today. If you know somebody that could benefit from listening to this episode, please send them on over to www.momandmind.com to listen straight from the website or to find their favorite listening platform. Thank you so much. Until next time. By joining us today, you are part of the growing community of people who are aware and concerned for mothers and families during this beautiful and sometimes very difficult time of life. If you or someone you know is having a hard time, help is available. You can feel better. Please look for resources for help at momandmind.com. Together, we can support moms and families so that no one has to deal with this alone. Thank you for listening and being a part of the Mom and Mind community.